Dr. King, you were just telling us your experience of going and having your feet washed by white people. And what was it that you were saying to them? There's so much discussion about how horrible slavery and segregation have been in America. And certainly that is true. And there has been repentance. And I said, well, we all need to repent. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to wash my feet, I need to wash your feet. We need to repent. We need to go before the Lord. And there has to be some forgiveness and some repentance, understanding that we are one blood and one human race. So if I were to be bitter and always angry about everything that had happened to me, I would never be able to move beyond that hatred and that fear and that anger into a truth. And reconciliation means that we reconcile together as one blood and one human race. So I should never be treated less than or more than, and someone else should not be either. And it should never be based on skin color. Mm -hmm. And so when I attend foot, foot washing ceremonies, I, Jesus showed that so well. He washed the feet of the disciples. And they say, no, you're the Lord. Let us wash your feet. And he said, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you're not going to be able to come into the places where I'm leading you. And so it's very important when wrong has been done, it has to be addressed. It must be addressed. And when it is addressed, there needs to be reconciliation. That's a really humbling challenge. You know, it's um, tempting just to move on in an interview and go to the next question. But I think we would really miss an important application point that you just shared. And our show really is about equipping our audience to um, be able to stand to life's challenges that are facing them. And what you just shared is an equipping point. Uh, when we feel aggrieved or tempted to take up a resentment or an offense, um, one of the best ways to tear out that root of bitterness is to humble ourselves. And the fact that you modeled that, I think that not only did you put into practice something that you see in scripture, but it sounds like you put into practice something that was modeled for you by your father and your uncle. So thank you for sharing that story. That's really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank I wanted you. to ask you about something else you do that's really powerful. You've spent your life being a pro-life advocate. And we want to get into all that you do in your ministry. But I would like you to share with us the story about how you came to be a pro-life advocate. Could you share that with us, please? Uh, from the very early beginnings, when I was in my mother's womb, and she was a college student and wanted to finish college, she didn't want to get married and be a mom. And so she was pregnant, and she told her mother that there was an organization called the Birth Control League. It would become Planned Parenthood. And they were advertising, come and see us. A woman has a right to choose what she does with her body. Abortion was illegal when I was conceived in 1950, but DNCs weren't. Those were surgical procedures for exploratory problems if a woman came in with a complaint. It wasn't a back alley or cold tank or anything like that. Doctors were doing it. And so my mom wanted to actually not birth me. She told her mom, and they went to their pastor, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., he would become her father-in-law and my grandfather. He says, Naomi, they're lying to you. That's the baby. That's not a lump of flesh. I saw her in a dream three years ago. She has bright mm -hmm. skin and bright red hair. She's going to bless many people. So my mother and daddy chose life together, and uh, they were supported by the family. And so after that point, for many years, none of that was discussed or talked about. I found out years later that my grandfather was an advocate against abortion throughout his life and his ministry. Many other people, he would say the same thing. So in, my dad was killed in 1969, as you know. My uncle was killed in 1968. I got married a week after daddy. Uh, I got married one week before daddy uh, was killed. He walked me down the aisle. And I got pregnant on my honeymoon. I birthed the baby. And right after that, I went back to my doctor six months after the birth of my son, and I wanted a pregnancy test. And he says, oh, no, you don't need another baby. Let's see. So rather than doing a pregnancy test, he did an in-office DNC mm. without anesthesia, and that was my second pregnancy. He sent me to Planned Parenthood, and I ended up with another abortion and a miscarriage. Mm. So 
And he said, don't talk to your family. Don't go to the church or anything like that. Just go over to Planned Parenthood. They'll help you from now on. I took birth control for a short while and had some issues in my own body. I threats with uh, my breast and cervix and things like that. But I was recovered without surgery from all of that. Now, I became pro-choice for a short season during that time. And I would go along with all the things a woman has the right to choose with her body, and I would advocate and fight for that. However, in the mid-1970s, I ended up with a divorce, and I was dating instead of courting. There's a difference between courting and dating, because courting doesn't have the sex, and dating can. And I got pregnant, and I was about to abort that child. Abortion now had become legal in 1973 with Roe v. Wade. January 22nd, which happens to be my birthday in 73. And so I saw an ultrasound, and I talked to my grandfather also, and he and the child's father said, no, we're not aborting that baby. And so my uh, the, the father of that baby said, you know, he was a medical student at the time. He said, that's 46 chromosomes, 23 of mine, 23 of yours. I want mine back alive. Mm -hmm. So I actually birthed that child. And so I ended up with two abortions, a miscarriage, and uh, some amazing doctors did some procedures in my body, and I was able to birth five more children. So I'm the mother of six living children and 11 grandchildren. And when I became born again in 1983, I confessed my own sins, which included the abortions. And I began to say, a woman has a right to choose what she does with her body. The baby's not her body. Where's the lawyer for the baby? How can the dream survive if we murder our children? And I've been saying that since 1983. Hmm. That's a powerful story. Well, I love that, that, that statement you just made. How can the dream survive if we take the lives of our own children? Right. Uh, that's powerful. Um, there was something that you... Uh, that I well that I learned in a report by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It came out in November of 2022, and it found that for women aged 15 to 44, the rate of abortions among Black women is four times higher than that of white women. How would you describe the impact of abortion on the Black community and on Black families, Dr. King? No. The major campaign has been, still is, started all the way in here in America with eugenics and genocide with something called the Negro Project and the Tuskegee Project. The Tuskegee Project gave syphilis to black men and treated half of them and didn't treat half of them, gave them placebos to see how fast that could go through the community and control the population. So that was the Tuskegee Project. The Negro Project gave free or low-cost abortions, no, no, abortion, I'm sorry, it wasn't legal then, uh, vasectomies and tubal ligations to prevent pregnancy and said that you could be a credit to your race if you don't have so many babies. So that's the precursor of the work of Planned Parenthood, the Birth Control League, the Negro Project, Tuskegee Project, those types of projects. And then after abortion became legal, then we see what happened. And so the black community, and then uh, as well later as the um, Latino community, to not, not, not as many numbers. So there was such a marketing campaign telling black people that you are credit to your race. You don't have to have so many babies. Let us help you. And so abortion was then, when it was legal, was called health care. It's not health care. Abortion absolutely is death care because it kills at least one person, the child. Sometimes the mother with complications after dies through, too, through sepsis or bleeding out or different things. Or There are other complications, mental problems, addictions and drug addictions and mental issues. So there's so much that's connected to marketing to the black community as a part of eliminating or lowering the numbers of our community. 